Well, we've talked a little bit about asset-backed securities of various types. Now we're going to get more deeply into them and answer all of your questions about asset-backed securities in this reading. So what are the benefits and what are we talking about in terms of uh, securitization to create these asset-backed securities? Well, uh, anytime we're using any kind of innovation in the debt markets, it's to reduce funding costs. Innovations that don't reduce funding costs are not going to be well accepted. So reduce funding costs, increase liquidity for the financial assets. If we have a lot of loans on the balance sheet, they're not very liquid. By using these loans to back an asset-backed security, the asset-backed securities can trade and there comes the more liquidity. It offers investors exposures to new asset classes, um, individual investors that may not be able to participate in whole loans can certainly participate by owning asset-backed securities in which the underlying asset is whole bank loans or a great variety of debt situations which are not very liquid on their own. We've got some terms of the, for the players in the asset securitization process. We put them in red for you. Here first is the seller. The seller is typically the corporation that originates the assets, the uh, debt securities or debt instruments, and sells them to the issuer. Now that issuer, which is often a special purpose vehicle, an SPV special purpose because it's created just for this purpose, sells the asset-backed securities and buys the assets. Investors buy the securities and receive the cash flows from the assets. And then the servicer collects the payments and takes care of all that part of it. And that's often the seller because they are, the debt is coming from the seller and they're in the best position to service those assets, collect the cash flows, and uh, get them to the special purpose vehicle so they can be distributed to the securities owners, the investors. So here's a picture of that. Take a look at it here. And just a simple example, customers buy cars and there are car loans. That's our debt assets here. And Fred Motor Company, not to be consumed, confused with Ford Motor Company, is the seller and the servicer. So they sell these billion dollars worth of car loans to the auto owner trust. That's the SPV here. And they are the issuer. So they give a billion dollars to Fred, and Fred gives them a billion dollars in car loans. And then the trust issues a billion dollars in asset-backed securities. Investors give the money to the auto loan trust, and then the uh, debt is serviced, and the um, uh, cash flows flow through the SPV to the investors. So that's the structure we're after. So make sure you understand that. It's not overly complex. Um, just understand that structure and you should be in good shape for this reading here. So how does the process? Well, we talk about the SPV as a bankruptcy remote from the seller. And that's one of the reasons we can lower funding costs here is because by taking these assets out of the corporation and putting them in a separate legal entity, then if there's financial distress, even up to the point of bankruptcy for the corporation, these assets are no longer in the corporation and the unsecured general creditors of the corporation have no claim against them. So that's why we call them bankruptcy remote. The asset-backed securities issued by the SPV may have a higher credit rating because of this than the bonds issued by the seller because they've got the specific assets with the specific cash flows. So if we can do that, that's how we're going to lower funding costs by getting a high rating on the asset-backed securities issued by the SPV. And so there we have a lower cost of funds with secured, securitization than by just issuing general claims against the corporation's assets and cash flows. So what kind of structures are we going to run into here? Well, the simplest one, the issuer may issue only one class of bond. They're all the same bonds. But they may also issue different bond classes with rules for distributing the principal and interest paid to the SPV. Rules meaning priorities. Who has first claim to the cash flows coming in? Who has second claim? Who stands next in line? This sort of thing. 
So one way we may split up these cash flows is called time tranching. Remember, tranche is just a slice, so we have different, different slices, different claims to cash flows, and those are our tranches. So as an example, consider tranche one, bonds receive all principal repayments until they're paid off. So that's why we call it time tra tranching. It's not the quantity of money that's coming in, it's they get all the money until they get paid off. And then tranche two, which is clearly next in line and a lower priority, lower seniority, receives all the principal payments, etc. So that's time tranching. With credit tranching, tranche C bonds bear any credit losses up to their par value. So we're going to say, well, tranche C takes all the credit risk, at least up to their ability to absorb them. And then tranche B bonds bear the credit risk, and finally tranche A bonds. Well, clearly tranche, tranches B and C are subordinated to tranche A in the bonds. Tranche A are the senior bonds, and they'll carry the highest credit rating. Depending on the structure and the size of these tranches, that may be a very high rating. That might be a triple A rating for that uh, uh, tranche that is most protected from credit, that is default risk. So let's talk about some specific assets. Residential mortgage loans. So these are loans with residential real estate as collateral. And we start with these first probably because they are the largest out there in terms of dollar value, I would guess, by far. And what do they look at with residential mortgages? Well, one important thing is the LTV, the loan to value ratio. What is the percentage of the collateral value that is borrowed? So typically we may see, well, minimum down payment is 20%. So that means that the loan to value ratio is going to be 20% or excuse me, 80%. So we're borrowing 80%, putting 20% down. Well, the more the down payment, the uh, better the loan to value ratio looks like. And they look better over time, assuming the values stay the same or drift up because the principal outstanding decreases each month over the life of a residential mortgage loan. So the lower the loan to value, the lower the probability of default and greater recovery percentage in the event of default. So let's talk a little bit about mortgages. Mortgages are typically loans from 15 to 30 years. Uh, they vary across cultures and countries. Sometimes they're 40, uh, even up to 100 years. The interest rate, it could be a fixed rate, it could be an adjustable or floating rate. Uh, the uh, mortgage could offer a conversion feature between fixed and adjustable. That is, it's adjustable now. Uh, you have the opportunity here, here, and here to convert it to a fixed rate based on this. That would be a nice thing. That would be a plus okay, uh, for the borrower. What kind of amortization? We've already described fully amortizing, partially amortizing with a balloon payment at the end, or an interest only. That's kind of like a bullet bond we discussed for the corporations. Pay just the interest until the principal, uh, till the maturity date, and then all the principal is repaid. So a whole range of amortization provisions there. We also have prepayment provisions. Now many, maybe even most, residential mortgage loans don't have prepayment provisions and uh, don't have a penalty. So that says if you own your house for six years and you still have 24 years to go on your mortgage, you can pay off the principal that you haven't paid off and be done with that. Um, it also allows for refinancing. If there's no prepayment provision and I took out a 5% loan to buy my house, and two years later, I look and see that market interest rates are 4%, it may make sense to borrow at 4% and pay off that 5% loan. And if there's no prepayment provision, then you can do that. Uh, you can refinance it at that lower rate and just benefit from the downward movement in mortgage interest rates. These mortgage loans can be recourse or non-recourse. Uh, a recourse loan means if you default on the loan, they take the collateral, dispose of it at auction or through some sort of legal sale. If they still come up short of what is owed, 
then they have recourse to the borrower, to their other assets. They can be sued. They can go after you. Um, on a non-recourse loan, that means they can have the property, but that's it. You toss them the keys, you're done. They don't have recourse against your other assets. And this admits the possibility of strategic default on non-recourse loans. That means if the value of the property is deteriorated enough and things just don't look that good, then you default. And so it's not that you really had to default, but that's why they'll call it a strategic default. Okay, agency RMBS, residential mortgage-backed securities, issued by government agencies, the Government National Mortgage Administration, Ginny May, um, or government-sponsored enterprises, and that's a, a slight distinction here, but one you should be aware of, government-sponsored enterprises, or GSEs, and that's the Federal uh, National Mortgage Administration, Fannie Mae, and also the FHLMC, which I'm imagining is the Federal Home Loan Mortgage Corporation. Only conforming loans may be included in agency RMBS. These agencies are buying loans from banks, and so they are conforming loans if they meet the loan-to-value um, um, metrics. Uh, the borrowers have a certain credit rating. We'll see these pools of securities, and uh, one of the things we can look at is the average credit score of the borrowers in there, things like this. So they have uh, uh, um, numbers, metrics that say they have to meet this. If the loans meet these criteria, then we'll buy them and include them in these uh, residential mortgage-backed securities. Now, what are non-agency RMBS? Well, this is going to be private entities that are doing the same thing. But the, they certainly don't put a government guarantee on the loans as they pass through. Non-agency RMBS have more credit risk because of this. They're not backed by government guarantees, and therefore they may need or typically need some sort of credit enhancement. Let's take a look at the structure of a typical mortgage security, pass-through security, type that would be issued by uh, Ginny May, the Government National Mortgage Administration. So it's a securitization, and the underlying assets here are a pool of mortgages. So you're not all invested in one mortgage. This diversifies your risk across many loans. So investors receive a pro rata share of all the cash flows. And the cash flows that are going to be coming into this pool from the mortgages are first the scheduled monthly interest and principal payments. But if there's no prepayment penalty, some of these mortgages the borrowers may prepay some of that principal. So you've got prepayments, you've got interest, and you've got scheduled principal repayments all flowing into this pool. Well, if investor one bought a 3% slice of this pool, then after taking out whatever the servicing costs are on servicing the loans, but that's usually relatively low, after that, they will get 3% of all the cash that comes into the pool. So that's why we call them a pass-through security. Okay? There's nothing much going on except the loans being serviced, all the cash flows going into the pool, and then you get your, if you own 1% of the pool, you get 1% of those cash flows. And some of the things we look at for these pools uh, in terms of evaluating them one here is weighted average maturity. The maturities of the loans are weighted by their outstanding principal, by their proportion of the value of the mortgages in the pool. Or we could have the weighted average coupon. The interest rates on the loans are weighted by the outstanding principal mortgages in the pool. So those are two measures, summary measures, that give us some idea what we've got in this underlying pool of assets in a mortgage pass-through security. So, back to non-agency RMBS, external credit enhancements, corporate guarantee by the seller, that's maybe not the most impressive, but it might be strong in some instances, a bank letter of credit, that'll be as good as the credit of the bank, or bond insurance from a company that specializes in insuring bonds and guaranteeing that they will make uh, their interest and in principal payments in a timely manner. And we also have 
internal credit enhancements, and they're internal because they're part of the structure of the ABS. Well, and I think we've seen these in different contexts before, too, at least a number of them. Uh, one way is to have a cash reserve fund. There's just a fund set aside. If there's credit problems, the uh, um, security holders of the ABS have recourse to those funds to cover credit losses. Certainly only up to the size of the cash reserve fund, but still, it's an internal credit enhancement, improves the uh, credit rating of the ABS securities. We could have an excess servicing spread funds. Uh, in that case, just make it simple, we've got securities paying in 6%. We sell the securities and promise to pay out 5.5%. Well, that gives us a little cushion there. Another way to do this, similar, is to have the, uh, have the face value of the securities less than the value of the underlying collateral. That is, we over-collateralize it by putting in extra collateral. Well, again, this excess can be used to absorb losses. It offers some protection and offers a cushion against unexpected um, losses due to defaults. And the third one here, probably the most fun one, is the senior subordinated structure. The subordinated tranches, so-called junior bonds, absorb the losses first, similar to a structure we talked about earlier with our tranches. In a shifting interest mechanism, this stops payments to the subordinated tranche if collateral quality deteriorates. So stops payments to the subordinated tranche, all the payments go to paying down the senior tranche. That's a shifting interest mechanism. But with those subordinated tranches, we can have more than two, and we'll have some examples of that where the one with the lowest seniority is uh, very much like an equity, and the highest seniority very much like a high-rated bond. 